Christian Heritage Ministry, in cooperation with Fuller Seminary, proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. Once again, my mother and father are privileged to participate in one of the great citywide evangelistic campaigns which have been sweeping our country these past few years. This campaign is in progress in the city of Philadelphia, and very shortly now we will take you to Philadelphia and join in the meeting there at Convention Hall. Everyone standing, please, and sing Heavenly Sunshine. 
and demonstrate to all that the people who have so heavenly sunshine in their hearts in Long Beach are just as happy, if not a little bit more happy, than the people who have heavenly sunshine in their hearts in Philadelphia. All right? Heavenly That sounded quite good now, but once again, this time giving it your very best and singing in the spirit. He has commanded if you would enter in, and then if you should live a hundred years below, in here you'll not regret it. You settled long ago, long ago, long ago. I settled it all. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, Hallelujah. and the record's clear today. For he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago.
join the meeting which is in progress at Convention Hall in Philadelphia, from where you will hear my father. Thank you very much, Dan. We're just a little bit homesick when we hear you singing clear across the continent, but Lord willing, we'll have the broadcast from the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium next large day. Just a word picture to the radio audience listening in. The rest of the broadcast of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour is coming to you from the beautiful Convention Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This beautiful hall seats 16,000 people. And as far as I can see, practically every seat is taken. And believe it or not, it's been raining for four or five days and we had to come through the rain to get here. And yet there's a great crowd out here in the Convention Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we're so happy to be here in the midst of the uh, crusade. Uh, Merv Roselle has had two weeks' meetings, and the Spirit of God is down upon the meetings, and souls are being saved. And a little bit later on the broadcast, I'm going to have my good friend, Brother Roselle, say a word to you. But right now, I'd just love to have this great group of Practically 16,000 people, 500 in the chorus choir, many ministers on the platform, some 600 churches cooperating. I'd like to have you all stand and sing Heavenly Sunshine. Will you do that? Oh, my. I tell you, I wish you could see this great crowd here today at Philadelphia. And as you sing through, turn around and give everybody you possibly can a good handshake all together. Uh, but... Wait, right. I... was a wonderful a cappella choir. Yes. <laughs> now, listen, follow me now, and let's all sing together and right into the microphone and send it out across the nations of this old earth, will you? All right. Heavenly. Sing it up. That's it. wonderful singing. Remain standing, and I'm going to ask Hilding Halverson, the song leader for the Merv Roselle meetings, to lead you in the old number in the sweet by and by. I love the old numbers, don't you? Amen. Amen. All right, sing it out. Hilding Halverson, where are you? There's a land that is fairer than day. Let's sing it, all right. There's a land that is says, let's sing one more verse. We shall sing on that beautiful shore. Every voice, all right? 
for a word of prayer, and I'm awful happy to have Mer Roselle by my side, uh, the leader of this series of meetings in Philadelphia. God bless you, Merv. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that thy hand might be rich upon this radio cast as it carries the story from our hearts in Philadelphia, from the voice of this man of God around the world to reach into every little home in our great nation and in the little homes of the broken peoples of the world, that thy name shall be glorified, and the free people shall stand together in the faith of our fathers. Answer the prayers of our radio pastor for the souls of people today. May many say yes to Christ in this auditorium, in the Long Beach auditorium, and in the homes across the nation, tuned, millions of them, to this central place in this great nation, in this singular hour. Thy grace, we pray, upon our hearts, and thy blessing upon our lives, thy sustaining force for the churches that stand as a testimony to the blood of our Savior. For we ask it in his wonderful name. And all the people said, Amen. God bless you. All right, be seated, please. My heart is certainly rejoicing today to see so many here, 16,000 strong, to witness the broadcast. And I'm so happy to have a little part in helping the meetings here and to back up my good friend Merv Rosell. God is using him and the men that are with him. And we pray for you daily, Merv, that God will use you. And before these meetings close in Philadelphia, that literally thousands may find the Christ of glory and become new creations in him. And now it's my happy privilege to introduce to you the sweetest voice on the air, Mrs. Fuller. Go right ahead on it. Well, greetings, friends, and special greetings to all the home folks. Leland Green, who directs the chorus, George and Rudy and the quartet, and the dear chorus, and Dan and Ruth and Janice. God bless them all. Well, friends, we're having a wonderful stay in this city of brotherly love. We arrived Thursday, and there has been a gentle and continuous rain ever since. I think it hasn't stopped one single hour, but it hasn't kept us in. Kind friends have driven us all over this beautiful countryside, so green and lovely, and all the maples and birch trees and and chestnut trees are just coming out in delicate green, and the dogwood is a bloom everywhere, pink and white, and pink crabapple trees everywhere, and tulips and lilacs. Oh, my. It's just wonderful. God has given us these beautiful trees, but I think man has not planted and cared for nearly enough of them. But here, people have wisely planted lovely trees year after year, and I've just never seen such beautiful country everywhere. Of course, I, being an Oregonian, do not mind the rain in the least. But I'm sorry. Well, I wrote this before I came to the meeting. I'm sorry that it's kept some of you friends who intended to come at home. But I don't know where we would have put you if you had come. (laughs) I'm going to read you just one letter today. We have such a full program. This is from a, a lady who has been gloriously converted. Dear Mr. Fuller, one day about 14 years ago, in our home in the state of Washington, my husband and I were listening to your broadcast. We were both perfectly miserable. I had my head in my hands, crying softly, for I didn't want my husband to know that I was crying. 
And we were both chain cigarette smokers, and I was a heavy drinker, really a drunkard. He was lying on a cot while we listened, and suddenly, as you were still speaking, he lifted his hands toward heaven, and he cried from the depths of his heart, Oh, God, save my soul. I jumped up and ran over to him and knelt down by the cot, and we both asked God to forgive us our sins, and we accepted Christ as Savior the best way we knew. I did not even know that the precious book said that old things would pass away and all things become new, but that very thing happened to us. That night, as I put my head on the pillow, I was almost afraid to go to sleep for fear that that wonderful joy which had come to us would not be there in the morning. But it stayed with us. God has been so wonderful to us all these years. He took away the craving for drink immediately, and he gave us complete, complete victory a little later. He has blessed our home with a dear baby boy and has done other wonderful things for us. As we've listened all these years, we have learned so much about the Bible. I wanted to write you before, but I've been so busy in our church. And we've seen our fathers and two of our brothers saved since we gave our hearts to the Lord, and all four have now gone to glory. We have a deep Christian love in our hearts for you both, and we do thank God every day for the old-fashioned revival hour. That is all I shall have time for today, friend. All right. Thank you, honey. And I just want everyone to know what a wonderful helpmate God has given me in Mrs. Fuller. She stood right by me all these years. I think just before the break on the station, I want this great congregation of 16,000 to stand and sing two verses of what a friend we have in Jesus. Will you? You'll know that number. Mr. Hilding Halverson leading. I'm so happy to have Mr. Smith the chairman of the committee here on the platform, and Mr. Steele, honorary chairman, who was chairman of the Billy Sunday meetings many, many years ago. God bless you. to the old-fashioned revival hour from the Municipal Auditorium in Long Beach, California, and from the Great Convention Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Charles E. Fuller speaking. You may be seated, please.
Give him a good hand, will you? Come on, give him a good hand. <laughs> Thank you so much, choir, and Brother Halverson for that splendid number. If you have your Bibles, turn to the second chapter of Romans, verse 16. Speak to you for a few moments, and I want you to pray that God will use the message to the salvation of souls. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, coupling that with Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Speaking to you very briefly today on the appointed day, the great mass of humanity the world over is unaware, tragically unaware, that God has appointed a day when he shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the blessed gospel. And as an ambassador of Christ, we need to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, and to warn men everywhere of the judgment to come. And especially may you who are now unsaved and in great spiritual darkness be awakened and repent and believe the gospel and be ready to meet God on this appointed day of judgment. Our Lord, when he was here upon earth, God manifest in the flesh, frequently referred to the day of final judgment, for according to John 5, 28 and 29, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation or judgment. The Apostle Paul, frequently through the epistles written by him, referred to the appointed day. Speaking to the Athenians on Mars Hill, he said, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because... He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Likewise, the apostle Peter, in 2 Peter 2, 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Again in 2 Peter 3, 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now uh, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And when I read in Second Peter 3 that the day is coming when the elements will melt, I in some measure can understand it because just a few days ago, Mrs. Fuller and I wending our way across from Los Angeles to New York City, we left on a Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock it took just about an hour and a half to go to Las Vegas, Nevada. We were up 18,000 feet, just 60 miles south of Frenchman Flats. And at 9.27, the pilot or the captain of the ship said, in three minutes they will explode the atom bomb. And there, 18,000 feet above sea level, with a clear, unobstructed view, I saw the flash, white, brighter than 50 suns instantly, and then a ball of fire like the setting red sun, and then the mushroom coming up. And I want to say to you here in Philadelphia and across the network, it was one of the most terrifying sights I have ever witnessed. I can understand in a measure what it says in Revelation when one-third of the earth will be burned up. But over the years... There have been periods of divine judgments. These divine judgments have come down upon humanity at large. But I want you to note at the conclusion of these few illustrations one specific point that I want to drive home to you. The judgments are in a measure a pre-picture or a foreshadow of the final last judgment, the appointed day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Christ according to the gospel. Take the days of Noah, Genesis 6, 5. God saw, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth 
that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it grieved God at his heart, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing. And our Lord speaking in Matthew 24, 37, who is the way, the truth, and the light, he puts his seal of approval upon that centuries later after the flood of Noah's days, and he said, but as it was, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, and marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And in Exodus 1 to 11, God sent the plagues upon the Egyptians because of Pharaoh's hardness of heart, defying God, setting himself up in the place of God and greater than God. And then centuries later, God's wrath was poured out upon the city of Jerusalem. The city was sacked, the inhabitants were slain and scattered, and the beautiful temple was destroyed. Why? Because, listen, of the gross iniquities of the people, their constant stubborn refusal to listen and to heed God's prophet, rejecting God's word. And hence in A.D. 70, the great Roman army under Titus captured the city, destroyed the temple, slew many of the inhabitants, others escaping to foreign lands. But wait, I want to call your attention to one outstanding fact in reference to these past divine judgments. In the case of Noah, we read these gracious words before the flood. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And later in Hebrews 11, we're told how he prepared an ark to the saving of his household. And that ark is a beautiful foreshadow or pre-picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish we had time to go into that. And in the days of Pharaoh, notice what God did. He called Moses aside and he said, Moses, I'm going to send the death-destroying angel over Egypt tonight. But every man for himself, take a lamb for himself, slay the lamb and apply the blood on the two sides and over the top in the form of a cross, not on the threshold, because the precious blood is not to be trampled upon. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And in the days of Titus and the destruction of the temple, Israel was scattered to the nations of earth, no rest for the sole of their feet. Yet, though Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, in God's own time, he will call them back to their homeland, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and they'll be reconciled to their Messiah. And all Israel, according to the eleventh of Romans, shall be saved in a day nationally. Please note now, and this is important, please note that in reference to all of these past divine judgments, the judgments of God were tempered with mercy and grace. Noah found grace. Israel saved by the shed blood in Exodus. Later in the days ahead, Israel will be reconciled to God in a day, and they'll be given a new heart. But, in reference to this appointed day, referred to in Romans 2.16, in this appointed day of judgment, the final day of judgment, there will be a judgment of works from which there will be no appeal, no probation, no mercy. It'll be final. It'll be complete. For it seems when I read those words coupled with Hebrews 9.27 that God's patience and long-suffering are an end. He will not always strive with man. And I say it on the authority of God's word that everyone within the sound of my voice must someday face God. And when he renders his decision at that final day of judgment, the sentences will be passed. As I said a moment ago, they will be final, fixed, unchanging, 
settled once for all. And for all the eternal ages to come, no second chance, no possible chance of escape. And when they are rendered, that will be fine. May we consider Romans 2.16 a little more closely and fully. Listen, in the first three chapters of Romans, or rather the section, Romans 1.18 to 3.20, we find the basic foundational teaching. God here reveals, now catch this, God here reveals not so much that all men are sinners. All men by nature are sinners. God doesn't have to prove that. It's a fact. All men by nature, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But taking that great fact into account, that all have sinned, that all by nature are sinners, he sets forth the teaching that all men must face God and be judged in that final appointed day of judgment. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, what's appointed unto men once to die, after that the judgment. Hence in Romans chapter 2, the heart of this important section from 118 to 320, we see set forth three things. I'll only have time briefly to just pass upon them. We see the principles God will use at this final judgment. We see the persons who will appear at this final judgment. And then the period of judgment, the day or the time appointed. Now listen carefully. Open your Bibles now. Second chapter of Romans, beginning at the second verse. For here we find four basic principles that God is going to use at the last final judgment of all mankind. The first principle of judgment will be according to truth. But we are sure, verse 2 of Romans 2, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And brother, listen to me. Picture, if you will, a court scene. And upon the bench of this eternal court sits God, the eternal God who is above all powers and principalities and powers and might, who holds the planets and the stars in the hollow of his hand. God is there. And I want to say to you that the case will be faithfully presented as you appear before the judge and God who knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. Nothing is hidden from him. Every deed, every action will be made plain and every secret unveiled. And the truth, the unvarnished truth, will come out. Absolutely true. Here upon earth, before the earthly forces of law, man has four chances to escape punishment. First, that his offense will not be known. He hopes to goodness it will never be known. And second, that he may escape beyond the hands of the law. Third, that there may be some failure in the legal process after he has been arrested, and after been arrested and put in prison, that he may escape from prison. But I tell you on the authority of God's word, at this final judgment, man's offenses will be brought out into the open, and there will be no escape, no probation, no mincing of words. It will be the absolute truth. Now the second principle of judgment is in verse 6 of that chapter, who will render to every man according to his deed. Don't think for one moment that you're going to sidestep that one. All the godless dictators that have shed the blood of millions of innocent uh, subjects will stand there and believe you me, God will render judgment according to their deeds. The third principle of judgment is in verse 11. For there is no respecter of persons before God. I don't care who you are, whether you live on the main line or not. As you stand before God, your heredity, your background will be of no avail. Your rating in Dun & Bradstreet will, a street will stand you of no avail. You'll stand there before God just as you are. 
in God's sight. No respecter of persons. And then the fourth judgment will be in verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men of Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And when I read that verse, I tremble. I'll tell you why. America has heard the gospel and is far more responsible today than it was years ago because over the radio and by great mass meetings, this country of ours has been blessed with the preaching of the gospel. And to stand before God, having disobeyed the gospel and rejected the gospel, I say it and I don't know whether it's scripture or not, I had rather be a heathen from the darkest jungle of the jungles in other continents and stand before God not having heard the gospel than to have heard the gospel and rejected it. For if we sin willfully, after that we have come into the knowledge of truth, according to the tenth chapter of Hebrews, verse 26, for if we sin willfully, that is, if you've heard the truth and turned your back upon the gospel, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, ser- a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. I haven't time. I must close. It's so interesting how quickly the little red hand runs around on the clock when you're on the radio. The persons, now I want to get this across to you, the persons who will appear for final judgment. And this I want to give to you as a point of teaching. I'm trying to teach the babes and those that have never heard the word. Bear in mind it is appointed unto men once to die. After that the judgment. Quickly now, to those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you will appear before the judgment seat of Christ which is the final day of judgment for all believers. And there you'll not be a judge for your sin or the sin question because that's settled once for all. But you will be there to have your works reviewed. For we must all, and the we in the epistles invariably refers to the members of the body of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and your works that there will be judged according to truth. They will be judged. Reward will be yours if you've been faithful. There'll be no respect of persons there. It'll be according to the gospel. You have this treasure in earthen vessels. What have you done with it? You have Christ in you, the hope of glory, and you're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Dare you hide that treasure and not pour out and beseech and win others to Jesus Christ. That's it. You're going to have to give an account of that. And then, those who stand before the judgment seat of Christ will receive a reward if you've been building upon the one foundation. Gold and silver and precious stones. Oh, I wish we had time to go into that. But there's the other class. And it's to you who are outside of Jesus Christ. I want to speak in the closing precious moments of the old-fashioned revival hour. To all the unregenerated, to all the ungodly, to all the unrighteous, the final day of judgment for you will be according to the 20th chapter of Revelation. When all the wicked dead will stand before God and be judged out of the books according to your works, according to the truth. What have you done? But the final judgment will be the second death, cast into the lake of fire, which burneth forever. And that lake of fire was not prepared for God's handiwork, God's creation, but it was prepared for the devil and his angels. And God is not willing that any should go there, but that all should come to repentance. And God has prepared a way, the narrow way, back to him through the precious blood of Christ. But if you die in your sin, God said, or the Lord said to his 
crowd one day, Whether I go, ye cannot come. If you die in your sins, but you'll stand before the judgment of the great white throne, the final judgment for all the wicked dead, and then cast into outer darkness in the blackness of separation forever. What shall it be? Will it be to be with him and appear before the judgment seat of Christ and have your works reviewed? Or will it be to stand as one of the lost before the great white throne, judged according to your works, and cast into the lake of fire which burneth forever. But God graciously said in his word, Come now, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Come now, him that cometh unto me, I'll in no wise cast out. Let's bow our heads in prayer in this great audience of 16,000 or more in Philadelphia and out over the network, wherever you may be listening to the old-fashioned revival, or out in Long Beach, bow your head. I'm pleading with you who are outside of Christ, won't you just kneel where you are and look up into the Father's face and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me for Christ's sake. God will hear that plea, answer that prayer. Christ will come in and take his abode in your heart cleansed by the precious blood.